So, we're at war, right? Anybody in here been, been in war before? Like, legit? Really, not one vet in the room? Okay, well, thanks to all the vets anyway, right? Even though none of you guys are vets, that's okay. Um, you know, freedom truly isn't free. So I appreciate all the vets um, who serve our country. Um, but whether or not you believe there's a war out there or not, we're at war, right? It's not some political divide that everybody's talking about these days. It's not uh, even a war on terrorism or a war against other countries, right? We're, I'm talking about a spiritual battle, a war that we can't see with our own eyes. In Ephesians 6, 12, it says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. All right, so take a second. You guys ever been to the beach or anything like that? Anybody? No, no vets in here, but you know, you've been to the beach, right? You've been swimming in the ocean, okay? You ever gone so far, your feet couldn't touch a bottle? Yeah? I don't know about you guys, but I start to, like, I'm sweating right now just thinking about it. Uh, you know, I get this really nervous gut feeling when I'm out there in the dark waters, and you can't see what's swimming around you. I remember one time, I was swimming in my own pool. My dad's pool, actually. But it was dark outside, and there were no lights out, and there were no lights in the water. And I couldn't even see my feet, and I started to panic a little bit in my own pool. It didn't help that my brother, Andy, of course, would point in the water and yell, shark! Well, they get it because they know Andy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was pretty nervous in my own pool because I couldn't see what I was in. You know, so I kind of have this rule, right? Uh, just keep your feet on the ground, right? Anybody, Ocean City, right? Chesapeake Bay? Let's not even talk about those murky waters. Even when your feet are on the ground, you can't see what you're walking in, all right? Well, I don't know about you, but when I think about the fact that there is a war going on around me every day that I can't see, I get that same kind of nervous feeling in my gut, right? It's pretty scary if you really think about it. We're walking around in the middle of a war, in the middle of a battlefield with a blindfold on. We can't see bullets flying, bombs going off. We have no idea what's going on, but we're right in the middle of it. So tonight, we're going to take a close look about how this battle started and exactly how we can play a part. So let's go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 1, right? And let's see what this fight is all about. So Genesis 1, we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He separated light and darkness. He said it was good. He separated water and dry land, and it was good. He created the sun, the moon, to rule over day and night, and those were good too. He created all the vegetation, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the earth, and they were all good. And then in verse 26, God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give, give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. This will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, Everything that has breath of life, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. See, God made all these things, and it was all very good. He made us, humans, in his own image, to rule over all of the good that he created on this earth. But there was something, one of God's own creations, that had to go and ruin it all for us. In chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from 
from the fruit in the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wait a second. Be like God? We were already created in God's likeness. He created us in his own image to rule over his creation. So this is where the battle truly starts. Satan throws the first punch, and he tricks us. Number one, he tricks us into rejecting God's definition of good and evil, and we define it for ourselves. And number two, he tricks us into submitting to the creation rather than exercising authority over it. This is the fight, guys. This is the perpetual war that is and has always been going on since the creation of time. And if you continue to read through Genesis, you'll see time and time again where man is tricked by his own definition of what is right or wrong and making bad decisions because of what their own desires are. Cain, Adam's son, out of envy, killed his own brother. Abraham, out of fear, lied about his wife Sarah and said she's just his sister because he didn't want the rulers of the land to kill him. He also chose not to trust God's promise and decided on his own that he should take Hagar, his wife's servant, as, as a wife so that he could have a son, Ishmael. And he goes on to be a huge problem for God's people, even today. We won't get into that. Isaac lied about his wife, Rebekah, the same way that his father, Abraham, did, for the same reasons. Jacob deceived his father, Isaac, and his brother, Esau, so that he could receive Esau's blessing. And the stories go on and on and on about how we humans, created in the likeness of God to share in his rule over creation, continue to lose sight of God's plan, and we subject ourselves to the sinful pleasures of this world and to our own definition of good and evil. And Paul puts it like this in Romans 1. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal gods of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with, an, with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. So what does this mean? Right? Are we at war against creation? Are we at war against ourselves? Not exactly. You remember in Ephesians 6.12, it said that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. You see, the fight is against the unseen powers of the dark world. We're not the only ones that rejected God, right? This is, sometimes this is part of the story that we don't exactly see when we're just reading through the scriptures. But besides the deceitful serpent, we see in Genesis 6 that other spiritual beings rebelled against God as well. And they took for themselves wives from the daughters of men. And their offspring became the heroes of old, men of renown. And so what we have here is an all-out rebellion, Man want to be like God, be like God, and rule the earth according to their own standards of good and evil, rather than conforming to the likeness of God and ruling the earth by the standards of good and evil that God already predefined. Side note, Satan really, really got one over on us because before in the garden, we had one rule. One rule, just don't eat the tree, right? Now we got like millions of laws of man and laws of God that we got to try to adhere to, right? So 
Oh, stupid Satan. <laughs> then we have the spiritual beings that rebelled against God as well. And they wanted to create their own godhood by leaving their heavenly place and coming to earth to be worshipped by mankind. I found a pretty neat video that I think kind of explains the entire rebellion pretty well and uh, puts uh, the spiritual battle into perspective. Cassie, do you mind cueing the video? Can we get the audio to unmute? No, it's number two. Hit the red mute button. Beautiful, ordered reality. So we've been learning about spiritual beings in the Bible, and I still have a lot of questions about the bad ones. Well, great. Let's talk about the Satan and demons in the story of the Bible. So let's start in the beginning. In Genesis 1, God creates a beautiful, ordered reality out of darkness and disorder so that life can flourish. He appoints humans as his representatives to rule over all of it, and seven times God calls it good. Yeah, I experience that kind of goodness often in the world, in things like beauty and truth, love and generosity. But in Genesis 3, we meet a creature who's in a state of rebellion against his creator. We're not told yet why or how he rebels, but he's on a mission to ruin God's good world for other creatures. This thing is trouble. Yeah, this creature is the Bible's first portrait of evil. It distorts what God has purposed for good, ruining and dragging creation back into darkness and disorder. So the humans join the spiritual rebel, which leads them back into chaos and death. And from this point on, the human rebellion is interwoven with a spiritual rebellion. And the biblical story shows how this happens over and over again. Okay, but wait, we're getting all this from a slithering snake? Well, there are clues in the story that it's more than just a snake. Remember, Eden is a high place where the earth and its creatures overlap with heaven and its creatures. So the snake could be a spiritual being. Well, Genesis 3 points in that direction, and then later biblical authors fill in the picture. Like when the prophet Isaiah has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, he's surrounded and being praised by the spiritual beings. Yeah, these are the cherubim around God's throne. But when Isaiah sees these creatures, he describes them as seraphim, which in Hebrew means snake. Ah, so the snake is like a former staff member in God's throne room. So why is he talking to the humans? Well, the prophet Ezekiel understood this figure as a spiritual rebel who didn't want to live under God's wisdom and authority. He wanted to be God. All right, that's the same temptation the snake puts before Adam and Eve. Exactly. He says they could rule the world like God, but by their own wisdom. So they're all kicked out of the garden. Yeah, God says this rebel will now crawl on its belly. Where does it go after this? Well, the biblical authors offer subtle clues where this being is at work behind the scenes, animating division and hatred between humans. They also use a variety of images to describe this being. It's a snake or a sea dragon or a dark desert creature or the king of death in the grave. He's also given many titles like tempter or the evil one or the devil, which in Greek means the slanderer. But his name is Satan, right? Actually, no. Satan is not a name. It's another one of these titles, which is why in Hebrew it has the word the in front of it. The Satan means the adversary because he isn't for anything. Rather, he's anti-everything working through lies to drag us back into darkness and disorder. That's intense. Now, what about these other spiritual rebels in the Bible called demons? What are they all about? Okay, so remember the concept of God's heavenly staff team, the divine council, or the sons of God. In the Hebrew scriptures, we're told that some of these rebelled too. When did that happen? Multiple times, actually. After the snake comes the rebellion of the sons of God in Genesis 6. We're told that they have sex with women who then give birth to violent warrior giants. Oh right, the Nephilim. These are probably the strangest characters in the whole Bible. Well, strange from your point of view, but ancient readers knew exactly what was going on. The ancient kingdoms around Israel claimed to be founded and protected by giant warrior kings who were part human, part God, and filled with divine wisdom. Ah, I see. So the biblical authors are saying, hey, those warrior kings, 
they shouldn't be honored. Right. In this story, they're portrayed as human rebels who are captive to spiritual evil, spreading their violence in God's good world. Yeah, and one of those kings in Genesis 10 goes on to build the city of Babylon. Yes, Nimrod, whose name sounds like the Hebrew word for rebel. And his kingdom leads to the next rebellion, where humans exalt themselves in Babylon. But God scatters that rebellion. And when Moses in Deuteronomy looks back at that story, he says that's the moment when God handed over the nations to worship the rebel host of heaven, the gods of money, sex, and military power. Moses is the first one to call them demons, that is, lesser spiritual beings. So demons are spiritual forces at work behind corrupt human power structures. Yes, but in the Bible they also work on the personal level, animating and exploiting humanity's greed and selfishness, as well as the weakness of our mortal bodies. In the Bible, spiritual evil is at work in anything that drags God's good creation back into chaos, darkness, and death. So this is why when Jesus arrives on the scene, he said his primary enemy is not human. Right. Jesus and his first followers viewed all the pain and suffering in God's good world as a sign of its captivity to death and spiritual evil. But they didn't think this was the end of the story. Right. Jesus knew that the only way out of this cosmic ruin is to overcome evil and death itself, even if it costs him everything. That was a pretty dark video, wasn't it? I thought, I thought I did a really good job of kind of illustrating how the forces are at work behind the scenes and how, you know, like the scripture says, we're not at war with one another. We're at war with the forces who are trying to get us to worship them instead. You see, every day we're tempted and taunted with things like lust, sex, money, greed, power, laziness, drunkenness, anything any other created thing that leads us to reject God's original plan. The list literally could go on and on and on. When we submit to these things, we're giving in to the dark forces at work that want us to worship them. They're just, they're just other created beings, right? But instead, we're supposed to be worshiping the almighty creator. Ultimately, by submitting to creation, we remove ourselves from the position of authority over creation that God wants us to have. Like in the end of the video, um, Jesus threw himself into the fight at all costs. He knew that the only way to free us from these forces was to defeat them once and for all through sacrificial love. He defeated these powers of sin and death, and by claiming allegiance to Jesus, we can reclaim our rightful place in God's kingdom. So, how do we take part in this battle? There's really only two options. You can either fight as a soldier in the Lord's army, or you can remain a prisoner of war, a prisoner of sin. So, I know we're supposed to have a break at some point and, and get a snack, and what I was thinking is right now we could do that and let these, let these thoughts kind of ponder when we come back. We can discuss a little bit more about, you know, all right, guys, let's talk about this fight. Let's talk about this war. So, what did you guys think of that? Uh, uh, you guys ever thought about the, the war being as, as, as dark as, really, as I was trying to portray it, as like the video portrayed? You guys ever thought about the spiritual warfare dark like that? Like, it's the only reason why I really chose that video, because I really thought, like, you know, it's, it's dark. Like, spiritual warfare is, is it's hardcore, you know? And too much of our lives, mine especially, like, sometimes we just kind of get in the groove of things, and we don't think about the forces that are acting against us. We don't think about, you know, what it means to fight in a battle, you know? All we want to do is get to work and get home, you know? So, let's, first of all, let's make sure we all clearly understand this, right? Jesus already won the war. We're going through this fight every single day, and the fight will continue to go on until the end of time. But Jesus has already declared victory. 
and we can take part in that victory by fighting in his army. So, how do we make sure we're fighting on the winning side? And that's an open question, right? How do we fight in the Lord's army? Trevor, I see your hand up. <laughs> What's one way we can fight in the Lord's army? Anybody else? How about... Yeah? We have to be right. We have to be conscious of this fight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And so as every day, you know, if we have to keep our minds and our hearts guarded and, and aware of the attacks on us, right? And as we read our Bibles daily, as we pray, as we spend time with our Father in Heaven and asking Him for His Spirit to, to help us to, to be aware of the situations around us and how we can stand up and fight against these principalities, Right? Not against each other, not against other people even. We have to understand, like Colin said too, that there's, there's powers working behind the scenes that 
are, are trying to get the win. Yeah, yeah, he, he, knows our, he knows our weaknesses. Unfortunately, he knows our weaknesses. And he's not afraid to use them against us. And that's why I think it's important, too, that we encourage one another, right, every day. That's what the early church did. They, they got together daily. They were encouraging each other. They were keeping each other on track. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, we're supposed to love God and love people, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I don't always feel like I'm on the winning side. <laughs> uh, oftentimes I, I feel like I'm not on the winning side because um, it can be pretty easy to fall into sin. You know, sin is easy. It feels good, right? And it's selfish. And sometimes that's what we want. We don't want to think about other people. We don't want to think about, uh, you know, what's the right thing to do. Okay. exactly right and it's easy for sin to get a foothold in your life and all of a sudden you're worshipping sin you're worshipping an idol right one of these dark powers over worshipping God right? <laughs> if I'm being totally honest when I was preparing for this lesson even I found myself getting distracted far more than I was actually working on the lesson you know, I ended up, I just had to come here and just get away from everything. My family's not even in town, and I'm at home by myself, and I'm getting distracted. And I'm like, you know, I need to go somewhere without distractions just so I can focus on my lesson. And uh, it's easy to, to idolize distractions. It's easy to idolize sin and to the point that maybe you don't even care.
Yeah, sure. Education's very important. You know, it's important to be in the Word. It's important to be around each other. You know, like, I like what Colin said, too. It, we don't always have to study the Bible every time we get together, too, you know? Uh, I think, you know, when we, when we had our small group, sometimes the most fun was after the lesson was over. We were just hanging out and eating and letting the kids play outside, avoiding cars, and you're just like Frogger, you know? You just, hey, wait, watch out. Not really, but nobody laughed. Hey, why? Well, you guys laughed. I love you. You guys don't know. You're joking. Well, <laughs> 40 minute lesson just turned to a 55 minute lesson. <laughs> More time for you guys to reflect. <laughs> um, but look, you know, when I was growing up in the youth group, what kept me on solid ground most of the time. Right, remember, I said this before, but when you're swimming in dark waters, you don't know what's around you, you got to keep your feet on solid ground, right? And for me, my solid ground was, it wasn't just my, my relationship with God. It was the people around me, the people I surrounded myself with. Not just the youth group. It was every day of the week, man. I was getting together with Jessica and Curtis, and, and you guys maybe not even know some of these people, but... I mean, that was my that was my crew, and I I needed to be around these people to keep me away from some of these dark temptations. And even now, you know, I need to be around you guys. I love you guys. You know, this is my family. And as we continue to share life together, you know, it's the encouragement that keeps us pressing on. As we encourage each other, as we do life together. That's what keeps us all on solid ground, right? And we need to make sure we're pursuing a personal relationship as well. But as we all encourage one another, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's right. That's why I'm not very good at Call of Duty, because every time I run off, there's like eight people that shoot me. And my team's over here, and I'm over here. I don't play Call of Duty. But it's the same concept, you know? It's the same concept. You're absolutely right, you know? Even the Navy SEALs, they at least got four people there, you know what I mean? They, you, you can't fight the war alone. You can't. Jesus was the only one who could, and he already won. And now it's up to us to keep the fight going until everything is done. I'm done. Right. So the memory verse, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 and 14. I, I added 14 because I think it's important. 13 says, be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Verse 14. Let all that you do be done in love. That's, that's Paul's encouragement to the church uh, in, in Corinth. And it's my encouragement to you guys. You know, as we, as we move forward, as we press on, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything out of love. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. No, he don't. He wants us to build walls. Yeah. He wants us to isolate ourselves. Yeah, cause division. Yeah. So I'm going to end with.